I've spent the last two years installing literally dozens of upgrades on this machine, and in the end, this tool head is what made the biggest difference. I've cut my print times in half. Here's how you can too. In today's video, we're going to be upgrading my Trident once again, and turning it into an absolute high-performance monster with the help of an unreleased experimental tool head, as well as some SLM metal parts, courtesy of PCBWay. Like all solid upgrades, today's were brought on by necessity. And some scope creep. About a month ago, I noticed my PT-1000 on the Trident was starting to give me inconsistent readings. After a little while, readings went from inconsistent to downright problematic. If I'm going to need to replace my PT-1000, I might as well install some upgrades while I'm at it. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves here though. I mean, what tool head am I even installing? Well, as of now, this tool head is currently unreleased. It's a modded version of Long's Mantis with an emphasis on rigidity. The biggest drawback of Long's Mantis is that the ducts are unsupported and tend to vibrate around during printing, which wreaks havoc on your input shaper graphs. This version fixes that by securely bracing the ducts to the extruder. The ducts themselves have also been remade and are optimized for more performance. Since this tool head is based off of Mantis, and the ducts kind of look like bananas to me, I'm going to be affectionately calling this tool head Banantis from now on, and I really, really hope the name sticks. Other differences between Banantis and Mantis include the 2510 hot end fan, and the fact that Banantis supports Dragon UHF only. Currently, Banantis relies on the stock Mantis carriage, which has a few pretty major disadvantages. First and foremost, belts are attached by simply squishing them onto the linear rail. While this does certainly work, it's not as strong as other options and tends to crush the teeth on the end of the belt, which permanently damages them. The other issue is that probe compatibility is very limited. Long's Mantis is an older design, so there are no options for newer probes like Beacon or PCB Clicky. Rather than design a new carriage from the ground up, I opted to modify the tool head to utilize the existing Zoll carriage. This opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. Not only does it support MGN9H, MGN12H, 6mm belts, and 9mm belts, but also monolith compatibility through the latest experimental Zoll carriage. On top of that, Zoll carriage already supports basically every single bed probe under the sun, so we don't need to worry about that either. Now that I functionally had everything done, I decided to check the center of mass of the setup. For best results, you want the center of mass to be both right in the middle of the linear rail carriage and also right in the middle of the belts. In practice though, most setups are quite front heavy with the comm being quite a bit off the linear rail block and the belts. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that these tool heads are bad, but they aren't optimal. I of course want to try to get the comm as good as I can, but I'm not going to do anything too extreme to get there. The blue dot here is the comm of Zoll, specifically Zoll with a Dragon High Flow and Sherpa Mini Extruder, as that's the default configuration in the CAD. My own setup uses a very chunky Orbiter 2, so I suspect my own comm is quite a bit worse than this example here. The red dot is the comm on Banantis. It makes sense that it's worse than Zoll, as Zoll doesn't have heavy 5015 fans up right beside the extruder. Still, it doesn't look too bad for what it is, especially when compared to other dual 5015 setups. The two most important factors for a tool head's input shaper performance are rigidity and the center of mass. I wanted to find a way to improve both of them at once. The solution? Metal. By making the carriage and the main body of the tool head out of metal, not only would it be much, much more rigid, but the extra weight of the metal parts would also help bring the comm down and closer towards the rail. Where can you get parts 3D printed in metal, you ask? Well, I got my parts SLM printed by the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay. PCBWay is your go-to source for PCB manufacturing, CNC machining, laser cutting, and yes, even 3D printing. They offer loads of different materials to choose from, and impressively short manufacturing and shipping times. Personally, my favorite service is their thread tapping service. I uploaded some technical drawings along with the step files, and all of the parts arrived at my door tapped and ready to go immediately. Not only did this save me a ton of time, but also ensured that I didn't make any mistakes and ruin my brand new metal parts. Whether you just need a handful of parts or hundreds, check out PCBWay for all of your manufacturing needs. The link's below in the description. Thanks again to PCBWay for supplying me with these parts for the video. For the rest of the parts, I printed them out of Polymaker Pop Blue ASA and also Carbon Fiber ABS. That way I would be able to pick and choose a color combination that I like, and also would have some spares on hand in case I break something. 
Okay, so at this point I've made what I think is gonna be my final decision for the color scheme, and that is these parts as follows. I printed an entire set out of the Polymaker Pop Blue ASA, and also a set out of Carbon Fiber ASA, and I've sort of been just mixing and matching pieces to get uh, the desired result. So the brace pieces here, these ones, I think it makes sense to use the carbon fiber because it is going to be stiffer. So we've gone with the CF for that. Same for the extruder itself, the Sherpa Mini. Extra rigidity definitely won't hurt there. I did go with the ASA for the K face. This is the angled K face here. Um, just because I want a little bit of a splash of color. I actually really like how my Zoll tool head looked with the uh, the light blue ducts and then the rest all being the carbon fiber color. I think that looked really cool and it works too because I still have a few little splashes of color on this machine. It's not all just metal and, and black so I think that'll be good. Um, the umbilical mount, I know this is actually a can board mount but I'm going to just use it as an umbilical mount. Again I want this to be as stiff as possible so we're going to use the CF. And then the ducts, I have the pop blue ASA for these. They look okay. Got a little bit of a burr from the support, so I'll have to take off there. That's okay. Um, I'm quite worried that those are going to melt because they do get really close to the nozzle. If they do melt, I'm probably going to need to replace them with something like carbon fiber nylon, something with a higher temperature resistance. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping these will last because I do really like the blue and I, I think they'll look, uh, they'll look fantastic right there on the tool head. So yeah, that's the plan. The new carriage bolts on exactly like the old one, except rather than using inserted nuts and heat set inserts, all of the threads are tapped directly into the parts. For the SLM carriage, all of the hardware is exactly the same as stock Zoll so you don't need to worry about needing new screws. The front of the carriage now goes on to keep the clips secured in place, and so far so good. The main body then attaches to the carriage using the stock M3 bolts on top and M3x8s on the bottom. I modded the Zoll carriage a little bit to receive an M3 screw rather than using M2.5 screws going the opposite way like the stock Zoll does. Or at least that's how the older versions of Zoll do it. I only did this because I didn't feel like sourcing any more M2.5s. I found that the best way to install the hot end was to remove the main body off the carriage and work on it separately. Start by feeding your hot end wires through the hole in the Zoll carriage and out the back. Just leave them dangling there for now, you'll thank yourself later. Installing the thermistor was incredibly tedious, and the super tight tolerances on the parts didn't help there either. Again, this was something I should have added more clearance for in CAD, but in the end I did manage to get everything to fit. With the thermistor in the front and its cable routed in the back, everything just barely squeezed in there. Then I could insert the heater cartridge in the back and install the whole thing back onto the carriage. In the end, it works quite well and the wiring is neat and organized, but it's definitely finicky to get everything in there. The hot end attaches via four screws at the top, and the extruder uses an angled K-face to screw onto this hole in the front here. When all is said and done, it looks very, very rigid. Once the extruder is mounted, next we need to install all of the bracing. The main upright brace sits on the front here, and it's sandwiched between the carriage and the ducts. You then use two screws to tighten everything down. The second brace attaches to the back of the Sherpa Mini, and then to the front brace. The ducts are secured with even more screws at the front, just to really, really lock them down. The part cooling fans are GDS Time 5015s, I know these certainly aren't the best 5015s around, but getting higher end ones in Canada is really expensive, and it's actually expensive enough that CPAP would be cheaper. In general, 5015s perform about 60% better than 4010s, so this should still be a significant upgrade over Zoll, even if my fans aren't the greatest. I was having some issues getting the fans to properly sit in the ducts. In the end, the solution ended up being to just cut some larger slots in the ducts, and I just used my flush cutters to do this. This will be a very easy fix in CAD, but for some reason, other people have run this tool head before and not had problems with the fitment, even using the same fans as me. So I'm not exactly sure why I'm the only one having these issues. Regardless, it's an easy fix, so not a big deal. I'm gonna be reusing my old probe module from Zoll with PCB Clicky. This is extra convenient because it means I won't need to readjust my Clicky dock at the back. I will need to update all of my probe offsets before I start another print though. Just like Zoll, we're using a Delta 2510 fan for hot end cooling. The Delta is the best 2510 you can get, hands down, and I'd highly, highly recommend using them, even though running 5 volt can be a little bit of a pain depending on what board you have. The gap between the main body and the ducts is just large enough that you can fit a JST connector through there. 
I use these little solder butt connectors to quickly splice on a JST connector, and that way I can easily disconnect my hot end fan if I ever need to. Now all that's left to do is tidy up the wiring and get it printing. Alright, I'm going to need to leave it at that for today's video. With some more tuning, I'm confident I'll be able to go even faster without losing any print quality, but getting to that point will take some time. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, do consider subscribing, as I have another crazy project in the works that I'll be sharing in two weeks' time. Until then, you can find me on the Rolahan server, and probably a whole lot of other Discord servers as well. Thanks again to PCBWay for making this project possible, and I'll see you guys soon.